what exactly makes everything on the planet work, right? And the fundamental fact is something that is very obvious for, you know, when I say it is, is sunlight, right? Light in general is the thing that makes everything happen. Um, but, and it's easy to kind of just say that and people go, okay, fine. But for me, it was more of why, like, why does the sun make everything happen? Right. And what, what exactly does that do? And, and not just the sun, but it's the, the relationship of the sun and the planet dictates pretty much everything. Um, and so, yeah, so I delved onto that, that rabbit hole for like six or seven years. And then finally this last year, I felt like I knew enough uh, about all of those systems, all the, all the physics behind nature and things, uh, of, of relevance to people that are trying to change their body or people that have something wrong mm -hmm. and they just can't quite figure out what's going on. Right. Like, Oh, I, I started, I started, uh, exercising more. I started counting my calories more. I've been more strict, but I'm not quite getting the results or I have this inflammation or leaky gut problem that's continuing to happen. And I, I actually find that I can help those people even more now that I know all these things. And that's what led me to, to kind of start the separate Instagram channel dedicated specifically to the science of how nature works yeah. and why living in the modern world kind of sets you up not yeah. to do things correctly, even though you might not be thinking about them. Um, and and one of the one of the main ones is has to do with light, right? The light that you surround yourself with actually has inputs at the mitochondrial level uh, that tells the mitochondria what to do next. Um, so something as simple as sunlight actually kicks off a whole bunch of processes in the morning, like when you see morning light. It's yeah. different than evening light, or different than the middle of the daylight, and everybody kind of understands that. But the fact that it's different means that your biology actually has coded some of the things in your body to respond to certain parts of the the light spectrum that it doesn't at other points in time. So this is a, a pretty basic one. Um, UV light, for example, mm -hmm. turns on the machinery for sex hormone manufacturing and other hormone manufacturing. The one that's very popular that everybody's going to know is vitamin D. So uh, UVB light sulfates cholesterol and turns it into vitamin D. Okay. So everybody kind of understands that, hey, you get vitamin D from the sunlight. Well, that's the actual process. Yeah. Your uh, UVB light from the sun or from a tanning bed uh, interacts with your skin sulfates the cholesterol at the subcutaneous level. So any fat that you have in the subcutaneous level and when sulfating just means that it's kind of broken up the cholesterol molecule. So it's changed it just enough that now your body can use it to turn it into other things. One of them being vitamin D. The other one that's relevant for people in fitness is the, I mean, vitamin D is relative for everybody, but yeah. things that, that, that people will pay attention to is like their sex hormone, panel, for example. And, uh, uh, everybody, kind of understands that, you know, there are certain uh, sex organs, whether you're a male or a female, that make your sex hormones. But those sex organs don't make your sex hormones from nothing. Yeah, They have to come from something. They come from cholesterol. So any anybody that knows uh, a little bit about hormones is that they all have a cholesterol backbone. And this is where it starts. Sunlight, UVA and UVB, sulfate cholesterol and that lets your body turn them into the first stages of sex hormones so for sex hormones that's pregnenolone whether you're a male or a female uh your cholesterol once it's sulfated gets turned into pregnenolone now the pregnenolone is useful for if you're a man your testicles to make testosterone if you're a female your ovaries to make progesterone and estrogen and uh so those processes alone uh, or, or that that light alone, right? UVA and UVB can make a lot of things that are very useful in your body. And a lot of people don't really grasp the 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 magnitude of that because UVA and UVB are present basically the whole middle part of the day, which also means that most people that work indoors, most people they're they're going to not sulfate very much cholesterol. And that's actually 
the contributing factor to why most people have high cholesterol. Wow. Because see, your your cholesterol does something, right? It's not it's not just there to give you a heart attack. That's not the point of cholesterol. The point of cholesterol is for you to interact with the environment, a uh, UVA and UVB, to turn it into things. But when you don't interact with UVA or UVB light, your body can't turn. Yeah, it it it's, it just continues to accumulate because it's waiting to be turned into things. And most often, I find that um, people with high cholesterol also have low sex hormone panels, maybe not necessarily the testosterone or the estrogen because the testosterone and the estrogen are way, they're the final product, Yeah, right? Yeah. There are sex hormones before that. One of, one, one of the ones I already mentioned was pregnealone, but not a lot of people get that one tested, but pregnealone turns into DHEA. DHEA is something that comes up on almost everybody's uh, blood work. That one is uh, sex hormone before testosterone, before estrogen, and before progesterone. So what I'll notice is high cholesterol, very low DHEA, uh, like almost at the bottom end of the range, especially for females, uh, because females have a unique... Uh, a unique uh, relationship with DHEA because they don't have testicles to make their testosterone. Uh, so their testosterone comes directly from DHEA at the adrenal glands. So the DHEA goes to the adrenal glands and the adrenal glands can make cortisol from the DHEA. And that's in both men and women. And then women at the adrenal glands also take their DHEA and turn it into testosterone. So you start to see a lot of problems with people essentially missing that nutrient, right? That that mechanistic nutrient of UVA and UVB, um, which when, when, I, when I grasped that particular relationship, I started telling people to do th certain things, right? Hey, in the middle of the day, I want you to, you know, take a 30 minute break and instead of uh, e eating lunch or eat your lunch outside with your shirt off and g get some tanning action going on. I'm like, I, I don't necessarily need you to get really dark. I just need you to get some UV light on your skin as much skin as possible like if you if you just go outside like right now I've, i got a shirt on and my face and my hands and my arms are potentially going to interact with the sun yeah but people also forget that if i put sunscreen on it's not going to interact with the sun right because i've also had people that go oh well i get a lot of sun you know i work outside i'm like well do you wear sunscreen oh yeah i wear sunscreen all the time i'm all like well that's defeating the purpose that's why your vitamin d is low and that's why your dhea is low the more and and i don't get like some people i don't even have to tell them anything other stop using the sunscreen right that's so right. let's 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 work into that and and stop using the sunscreen next thing you know two or three months later their their vitamin d level is now up their dhea level is now up i'm like see there was nothing wrong with you you didn't need supplements you didn't need you know uh any, anything like that you just needed to actually let your skin do the work that it's supposed to do now some people if they've been indoors for a very long time and 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 they have what i call have atrophied skin you have to do some things uh just like training right like if i told you to, to go in and do a hundred bicep curls, your biceps are going to be trashed in one day, right? Like that, they're not going to work for a week. But if I tell you, Hey, go in there and do a set of 10, wait a minute or two, do another set of 10. And let's just call it there for the week. Next week, we'll do three sets next, you know, a few weeks later, we might do four. It's, it's no different than training. Um, when it comes to exposing yourself to, um, environmental stressors and things of that nature. Um, and then, Another thing that you mentioned uh, before we got on, grounding. Grounding actually is very, very helpful to get more sunlight for the same amount of time. So for example, if you have very sensitive skin, that actually tells me that you're probably missing electrons to collect electrons. Uh, this is a little bit sciencey, but it's important to know. Um, a lot of people don't understand how solar panels collect and make electricity. But the simple thing is the solar panels are made of things that have extra electrons. And this is something called the photoelectric effect um, by, by Einstein. So when you have electrons and other electrons hit it, it makes the electrons more energized and it produces electricity. Okay. When you ground, uh, you, you are now... Before, Go ahead. Can you can you tell people what grounding means? Because maybe someone doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know what it is. Yeah, actually. So let's 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 actually delineate two things. So I like to actually call it earthing versus grounding. Right. The reason for that is there are people out there selling you things that don't work, 
that are supposed to be able to let you ground inside your house. And that can potentially be problematic. So I'll distinguish those two. And that, that's a good point. So grounding is anything that puts you in contact with a grounded wire or, or the ground itself. But that's not always beneficial because there, uh, if you type in grounding right now uh, on the internet, you're going to find like pads and things of that nature that you can plug into a wall at the, at the neutral socket. And now they say, oh, now you're grounded. The problem is you don't know if the electrician that built your house grounded the wiring correctly to the ground. If you don't, right, like if it's not done correctly, you're actually now taking electrical current, AC electrical current okay. into your body. You, you don't want to do that, right? It's no different than if uh, there was a wire in the ground and you went and stood over the top of it. You're going to get some residual electricity. So that's why I don't recommend grounding devices. So right? if, you, so, if you would like make the connection yourself and you put like a rod outside and you the copper wire that would work yes now now you're officially but see that that's that's why i like to call it earthing because yeah. see you physically have gone out to the earth and verified that you are touching it right um so what you just suggested would be the workaround so you could still use those devices the grounding pads and stuff like that if you took a grounding rod and put it outside okay um because now you are physically touching the earth and you verified it other things are simple uh like touching a tree touching a tree grounds you the, the tree is grounded you don't have to physically take your your shoes off you can touch a tree with your bare hands as long as it's skin to earth contact you're going to be grounded you're going to be earthed and when that happens you are actually now kind of like an antenna in the in the line of chain of the sun and the planet earth that so the planet earth is a cathode so it's negative and the sun is positive okay and that's actually what makes our ionosphere and our magnetic flux on our planet like everybody knows about the aurora and all of those things in the, in the north and in the south though that's a magnetic ionosphere that's that's happening because the earth is negative and the sun is positive when you physically are touching the earth you are now getting negative electrons you're getting that's what electrons are. They're just a negatively charged particle. So you now have a lot of electrons, which means that you can now collect more sunlight. Think of it like two magnets, right? If I have a negative end right here and I have a, a positive end, I'm going to attract it if this one gets stronger, right? If the negative end gets stronger, I'm going to attract more of the positive. And what did I just say about the sun? It's positive because the main gas that's being burned in the sun is called hydrogen and that's why it gives the the sun the color um those are all positively charged particles so when you ground you're able to collect more sunlight in less time which means your skin won't suffer as much damage if you're very sensitive to to sunlight there's lots of things like that uh other things that will do that are the membranes the membranes of your skin so how much fatty acids because your your membranes on all your cells are made of fatty acids the type of fatty acids that they're made of make a huge difference um in terms of protecting your skin from damage of all kinds but you know a lot of people that are listening to this might be you know being told to not go in the sun or have just been told you know over the years that the sun is potentially bad for you and that you need to wear sunscreen all the time and that can be further from the truth when it comes to total biology because at the end of the day everyone's gonna age right like there, there's never gonna be a solution to that so in the meantime what is actually keeping the system running so that you can have good hormone panels have good neurotransmitters and things of that nature well a lot of it has to do with the environment sunlight if you live somewhere where it's permanently sunny all the time uh or if it's only sunny at certain seasons then there's a secondary mechanism uh which is cold uh i know we're not really going to talk too much about cold but that is a secondary input mechanism that's just like sunlight it's the backup signal for uh for for your body to create all of its uh neurotransmitters and circadian rhythm right so the timing of how your body makes things uh is dictated by the sun and it's also dictated by by cold um grounding is just a beneficial way to be able to collect both of those things so grounding is kind of one of these fundamental things that people have kind of forgotten and it's it's actually really modern 
because up until like 50 or 60 years ago, uh, most shoes actually had leather soles. Yes. Leather grounds you. So any animal skin grounds you. But up and up until then, right? Uh, everything was leather. So you people were actually grounded the whole time. The, not being grounded while you walk around is a new thing for our species. That's something new that that we're not really. Let's put it this way: no, nobody really puts a lot of thought into it because it's hard to comprehend that that we're not connected to the ground anymore in, in, in normal life. Um, but like I said, just moving to leather shoes immediately kind of solves the problem. Um, you don't have to physically go outside and take your shoes off if you have leather shoes on all the time. You have to be on on earth, basically, or on sand. And I guess mm -hmm. it also works, right? Uh, say that one more time. If you In the module, you said that you could also do it on a pool. You can exchange the electrons as well in water, bodies of water. Yeah, yeah water is excellent. So, so swimming, uh, just hanging out at the beach, that is an excellent, excellent conductor. So, and not only that, there's electrons in it. That's why there's sodium and potassium and magnesium and seawater. Those are electrolytes, right? And we have them inside our body as well. We use them for electrical conductivity. That's why they're called electro electrolytes. They're donating electrons to chemical processes and things of that nature. Um, so when you go to the best grounding ever is going to be on a beach next to the ocean or in the ocean itself, for sure. Because now you have an infinite amount of electrons that you can funnel to collect even more sunlight. Here, and, and most people will find that even if they're really sensitive, but they spend most of their day in water, even if, if even if you're not necessarily getting wet, but you you know have your feet in the water or you just kind of play in the shallows, you don't get nearly as sunburned by a long, long- Chat to that after you listen to your modules, like I'm gonna give this a try, I guess. I don't know. And then I, I have a, a floating bed. And oh, okay. By the ocean. So I went to the ocean. The sun was, it was like middle of the day, super hard sun. And I went and I spent probably like 30 or 40 minutes and I came back home and I didn't feel much of a difference in my skin. I, I felt lightly burned, but not, it didn't feel like. Not fried. I'm honest, like you, you, you probably like expect. That. Yeah. Like I expected to feel with that, the, the intensity of the sun that was outside. So I was like, oh, yeah. it works. <laughs> it, it does. It really, really, really does. And I've, I've ran that experiment myself uh, in El Salvador. So I went to El Salvador for two months. Uh, and every day from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., I would just go out to the beach and lay on the beach, uh, just, you know, barefoot and everything, uh, and do most of my work there if I had to do work, like uh, client calls and stuff like that. And I did that every day for two months, never got burned once. And I got a lot darker, a lot darker. But the the most crucial thing, and, and I have kids that uh, are uh, more pale skinned than me, none of them burned either. And the reason is because all of those electrons actually ha help you uh, collect that sunlight and internalize it. Um, the best The best way that I can describe it is, if, well, actually, if you have like a, a white piece of paper and a black piece of paper and you put them out in the sun, the black piece of paper is obviously going to get hotter, right? Because it can collect uh, more energy. Um, and when you have a lot of electrons, you actually take that energy and immediately turn it into electrical energy. So a lot of, and this actually manifests as suppressing your appetite. So People that spend a lot of time out in their sun, especially in in high amounts of sun, and they and they have good electron flow, good DHA, DHA, and uh, and and they're not really lacking any problems, right? The perfectly healthy people, they will experience less hunger during the day. They can actually work most of the day without eating, and they tend to only eat in the morning and only eat in the evening. And you probably have noticed this with uh, the workers down there in Mexico. You'll notice that a lot of them will either take a nap in the middle of the day or just kind of hang out in the shade, but they don't really eat a lot of food, if yeah. any, right? Yeah. They might have some water and stuff like that, but they really don't sit down and eat a meal. They usually have a really big breakfast, and they're outside all damn day. And they'll, you know, in the middle of the day, they'll take a rest, they'll take a lunch break, but it's usually just a water and a nap. And then they get to work again. And then later that evening, they'll have a big meal. The reason is when you're collecting a lot of electrons, you're supplying electrons to the mitochondria without food. A lot of people don't know this. Food, all of it, turns into electrons. 
right? That's so, so when you're eating food, it's because you're missing electrons and you're giving it back. Your body runs electrically, just an, like an electric car. The difference is you, nature has learned to collect electrons from sunlight. So that's all the plants, right? Plants make all their food from sunlight. They're collecting electrons. Animals will either eat the plants or eat other animal products. And those also provide electrons. But the thing that people have kind of forgotten is that we evolved somehow from plants. Yeah. At, like, like at some point long, yeah. long ago, we deviate, which means this. All animals have something called mammal photosynthesis. And our mammal photosynthesis doesn't necessarily provide sugars for us. It provides other substrates. And we just talked about some of them at the very beginning, right? Sunlight literally interacts with your body and starts making things like hormones, right? So animal photosynthesis has taken sunlight and utilizes that sun energy to create other products other than just food. Plants just take it in to create their own sugar, their own food. And animals have taken that and turned it to make sex hormones, to make neurotransmitters and things of that nature, because we can eat our own food, right? And that just supplies extra electrons. This is this is fascinating, man. And in the end, it sounds like the the hippies were right. It's like hug the tree, spend time outside, and you're gonna feel better. And you do feel you you feel better immediately. Um, so I guess I guess people, like you said at the beginning, the lifestyle of most people living in major cities, working at nine to five, conducts to a very if if not none at all sunlight or grounding. So what are the the most common deficiencies or biological problems you've seen that people run into when don't get enough sunlight or they don't do any grounding at all. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about the, the, the sex hormone issue. We won't really kind of, uh, so that would be to... Lead to like low testosterone for men. Like, yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's, let's kind of just categorize it for men and women. So when you don't get a lot of sunlight, um, or, or ground very well so that you can capture the sunlight that you do get, um, you will manifest eventually into a low testosterone state that happens easier in women than in men okay but both are subject to that but before that you'll see the the dhea so that's the the precursor molecule to all of those downstream that's where i look first right by the time you get to low testosterone and low uh uh sex hormones and sex hormones i know for a fact that their dhea is way down at the bottom of the range and sometimes deficient right sometimes it's flagged deficient so the i would say is the start of sex hormone starts to go down because the main products go down and the other thing that i see is vitamin d right you'll see vitamin d and DHEA in both men and women be down at the very bottom. And then whether that manifests as low testosterone will be sooner in women than men. And it usually is at the end of the stage, right? By the time you have low testosterone, you have really low DHEA. And you probably are feeling tired during the day and more awake at night. Because in order for that to happen, the, the low DHEA uh, in both men and women, remember how I said DHEA by your adrenal glands turns into cortisol. Yes. Right. So what'll start to happen as you miss sunlight, your cortisol spike doesn't get as high in the morning anymore. And when it gets really bright, which is when you go home and you turn on all your lights because you were indoors all day, that's the brightest part of the day, right? Because right now uh, it's daylight outside, right? So you probably have some lights in your room that you actually turn on more uh, at night than you do during the day, Yeah. right? Wow. So you actually literally make your room, your, your, your environment brighter at the wrong time of day. So what ends up happening is the cortisol stays low because you've been indoors all day. Then it spikes up high in the evening. And then you try to go to sleep and you can't sleep. So you start ending up with sleep problems. So now your recovery is bad and the daylight that stimulates the, the accumulation or the, the mechanical stress that creates the sex hormones starts to go down. So you end up with two kind of hallmark things. You're tired during the day, your sex hormones are low and you have a low vitamin D. And wow. then if this goes on for long enough, then you start telling me 
I have a really hard time going to sleep. Like it takes me 30 minutes to go to sleep or longer. And when I go to sleep, I can't stay asleep. So that's like way up, like, like if you have all of those plus the sleep issue, this tells me that this has been happening for like seven, 10 years of this rhythm of you. And and that's the thing, right? Like none of this is going to happen in one or two years, right? So like when you, you know, normally when you go to school, right? Like when you're a teenager, you go to school and you get a lot of time outside, right? You get to go play and stuff like that, or at least when I went to school, I don't know if they do that anymore. (laughs) But anyway, when you're a kid, you find a lot of excitement about being outside, right? So you're outside a lot more. And then you go to college and now all of a sudden, you're indoors learning all the time and then you're an adult and now you have a nine to five job and you're indoors all the time. Right. So about a decade to two to do to two decades is when you really start to see problems. So basically when you're in your thirties and then you're in your forties, that's when you start to see the problems of circadian rhythm shifting to a not so favorable environment because we are not only are we mammals, we're also diurnal mammals. Right. So that means our biology is set up to exploit sunlight for all of the anabolic processes that it has and exploit no sunlight. So darkness for all of the things that it has for restoration and all of those things. Right. Because we're a diurnal creature. Right. Like bats and rats and nocturnal mammals, their biology is actually flipped around. Right. So you have to think about you know, people that work night shift, people that works uh, oh, yeah. swing shift. Now you really start messing with things because their biology doesn't even understand what's going on at that point in time. And they break down in half the time. So people that work night shift, one decade a decade of night shift, you've shaved off a decade of, of your life at the end. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's powerful, man. So, yeah. No, go ahead. You wanted to add something. Uh, no, 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 that, 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 that was just kind of my, the end of my thought on the, on the night shift, but I was also going to add, um, the, the other thing that I see when it comes to just phenotypes of like, Hey, what generally is going on? Another thing that I see is once sleep starts to kind of get disrupted a little bit again, because not everybody knows this, right? Like a lot of people that I talk to don't really understand that these fundamental things, right? Which aren't really, I I guess I almost take them for granted, right? That people know that we're mammals and that we're diurnal mammals and, and all of this stuff, but not a lot of people know that, right? So they might start having sleep problems and just continue with that lifestyle. Once you have sleep problems going on, you have maybe about two, maybe three years before you start to have depressive problems. Because now you're messing with neurotransmitters, right? When they turn on, when they turn off, right? And things of that nature. Uh, It's not always sleep, then depression problems. Sometimes it's depression and then sleep problems. They kind of flop back and forth. But those are towards the end stage of you've already been living this lifestyle of uh, sun deprivation and and uh, just being disconnected from the outside for about a decade or 15 years. So you think that possibly part of the, or maybe the root cause of, because there's like a wave of depression, especially mm-hmm. in the is due to the lack of connection with nature, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you can say it like that. I, I just, the way that I say it is it's being disconnected from the thing that helped you become human, right? Like the sun and the earth is the actual environment that created humans, right? Like, like if I, if I took and put a fish in a fishbowl, I have to make it like the yeah. fish's environment, because if I don't, that fish slowly dies. Like that's not a hard concept for people to understand. And so then you got to think about yourselves. Are we now the fish in the aquarium? And and we're just not setting up the aquarium correctly? Like that makes the most sense for me to explain it as a whole, right? It's not just, it's nature. It's like, okay, great. It's nature, but that is the environment that you evolved into. And you, I, I'm, I'm not going to ever say it like, Hey, you just need to, you know, throw all the modern stuff away and just live out in the middle of nowhere. But in a sense, that would be the ultimate solution or thinking about the problem and trying to solve it differently. Right? Like, for example, 
I have a stand-up desk that's nice and light. I'm literally doing this podcast outside because I can, right? Because I have a choice, you know, because I work from home instead of spending all my time. Because that's another thing. I've noticed uh, this this onset of depression and like these this this these symptoms go up in the last three years because more people work from home. And they're very comfortable about being inside their house, right? Like, I just get up, I just drink my coffee, I turn on my computer, I watch some Netflix, I work a little bit. You know, they're they're doing stuff all day long, but, but it's in their house the whole time. And then they get dark, so they turn on their lights, and then they relax and have a chill, on, you know, and watch a show. And then they, they try to go to bed. They have not left their house unless they had to go grow grocery shopping or, and even then you're going inside another building, right? Like that is car, fundamental. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like fundamentally you're now the fish in the fishbowl and your environment doesn't represent the environment that you involve yourself in. So I guess someone that's listening to this, they might feel, feel a little defeated because they got, you know, maybe they got bills to pay, they got a family and they're like, well, I would love to be able to spend more time outside in nature, taking more sun, but I got to pay the bills. I got to provide for my family. So yeah, person, yeah. what are some, what are some alternatives that they can implement in their day to day to just make, make changes in the positive direction, make positive changes? Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the biggest things, right. Um, is number one, try to find a job. Like, again, most people, kind of understand that you know you're you're you choose your job by your skills and how much it can pay you right but something else that i like to get people to think about you also have to think about the health consequences of that job right like swing shift night shift those are jobs that okay if you have to take them take them because they're going to pay you good money and always be figuring out a way to change jobs so that's number one start thinking about your job of does it help this situation that we just talked about or not now i'm not saying that everybody should go and just change jobs to that. But if it's a possibility for you, that's like option number one, something that lines up more with what I'm about to say, something that gives you uh, a time to go into work at about eight to nine in the morning would be ideal. A little bit later would be better. And something that uh, at least allows you to take a lunch break, right? Outside, like that's number one priority when it's like, if, if you can modify your job somehow, it's that. So the reason why I say that is because now the recommendations, right? So the recommendations would be the most important sunlight to get to keep everything running really well is AM sunlight. So that's the first three hours of sunrise, right? And the reason why that is, is because that is the start of the 24 hour cycle that your biology has been set up on. So you want to wind the watch essentially every single morning, right? So that your eye interacts with sunlight and ideally if you, you should be grounded, it doesn't have to be a necessity. So if you commute right at this time of day, a simple hack is literally rolling down your window. When you roll down the window, uh, there's no obstruction. So that's another thing to taking in, into consideration with the job scenario is, if you can work next to a window and it's able to roll down, that's always a plus. Glass through, or, or I mean, sunlight through glass really messes with uh, with things that, uh, sorry, I got to mute that, um, really messes with how sunlight penetrates because, it, uh, or, or not how sunlight penetrates the glass, but how sunlight penetrates you because it's not the same. Yeah, Glass cuts out about 80% of the UV light and about 40% of infrared. So the light that you get on the other side of glass is not the same as outside. So that's why I tell people you, you have to roll down the window or the sunroof, right? Roll back the sunroof. But the main thing is you want about, is you want some time that you don't, you can just dedicate to, I can go outside and get some daylight, right? It doesn't have to be sunny as long as the sun has already risen. So sometime in the first three hours of the day, that sets the circadian rhythm and that immediately raises cortisol on purpose. We want that to happen. We want cortisol to raise in the morning because what that means is that cortisol will still be raised. And then as the day progresses, cortisol will start to dip down. And when that does, you make neurotransmitters like dopamine and things of that nature. Um, dopamine uh, also helps create melanin. So that's also preparing the skin for the next recommendation, 
but it's basically later sunlight, right? Like middle of the day sunlight. Because when dopamine raises, it can be turned into melanin and melanin can be turned into dopamine. And those neurotransmitters influence adrenaline and noradrenaline for wakefulness for the rest of the day. So what I'm saying is if you can make it a routine to just get outside for about 10 minutes, it doesn't have to be very long, for about 10 minutes to get your face and as much skin as possible uh, interacting with morning daylight in the first three hours of the day, that takes care of setting that circadian rhythm of everything that I just described. That also means that later, in the evening, as long as you're diligent about not getting a lot of bright light in your face, uh, like uh, just turning on all your lights, that's that's kind of a bad habit that people get into. Like, I'm not saying don't turn on lights. I'm saying you got to have a time away from bedtime, at least 90 minutes, ideally two hours, where you've actively diminished the amount of light going into your into your eyes. Um, so I like to call it this way. You have dinner. Most people will have dinner around 6 or 8 p.m. And when you have dinner, that's the cue of once you've cleaned up, you want to reduce lighting, especially overhead lighting. Ideally, turn it into some red light or uh, diminish blue light in general. And that, as long as you did the morning stuff, that last bit is important so that everything happens correctly at night as far as raising melatonin and things of that nature. So really, that is... blockers work in that scenario? Say that one more time. Wearing the blue light blocker glasses with that salt. It does. It does help. It does help. That's the most significant part. So your eyes are the most crucial part in that evening circumvention type scenario. Um, The reason why it is uh, not 100%, right? It's about... 80% effective. The reason why it's not 100% effective is because the the receptor for blue light in your eye is also on your skin. Mm, Okay. Okay. So there is going to be some skin that interacts with the light. That's, you know, if you have all your lights on it, but you put the blue light blocking glasses on, the majority of the signal will be tuned out by the brain because that's another thing that people don't. Uh, well, some people might know, but your skin is directly connected to your brain wirelessly because your brain and your skin were the same tissue as an embryo. And then they split and the skin now forms the exterior. There's no actual connection. There's no nerve that connects your skin to your brain, but because they were the same tissue, they have the same atoms, which means they're entangled by physics. So when one experienced something, the other one experienced it. And that's not really hard to uh, to understand, right? Like even if you're not seeing somebody in the room, you can almost feel the presence of another person in the room, uh, even if you they are intentionally trying to hide from you. And the reason for that is is because of this sensation of, the skin interpreting pressure waves and things of that nature, yeah, directly tying it to your brain. So immediately you get a sense of electrical conductivity at the skin. Um, and that part of the skin and the brain talking to each other is incredibly crucial when it comes to thinking out of the box of how you can help yourself with the blue light, right? So for example, dress up in the evening wear more clothes in the evening. Yeah, yeah, just put on clothes, more clothes, put on some blue light blocking glasses. But honestly, the the easiest hack is this. You buy some red party bulbs, Uh you put them in some lamps. So after you get done cleaning up, then you can have six, seven, eight of them. I don't care how many, you can have as many as you want. And you turn them all on at night. It costs you like, $8 $8 for a party bulb, right? And you get a, get a pack of like 10 for like 30 bucks and you just put them in some lamps and it does two things. It eliminates lighting from up high to down low. That's important because your eye has evolved for its blue light receptors. The ones that I told you that are in the skin, the majority of them in your eye are on the bottom of the eye. The reason is because the sunlight comes from the top. Yeah. Okay. And on the top of the eye, significantly less. So you change the light from Uh, It can be orange or red, and you move them down low. And you can still have plenty of light to do everything, right? And if you need to have, like, whiter light to actually kind of see colors and stuff like that, go with an incandescent light bulb. Okay. Yep. That's, that's That's the simplest way to kind of hack your environment at night so that you don't undo things of what you did in the morning, right? So that's very crucial to understand that. Even if you're diligent about getting outside in the morning, but you still 
mess it up at night, you kind of undo that effect of setting up the circadian rhythm correctly. So that's really what keeps timing and everything going correctly is those two things. Now, the, the second most important part is actually collect taking the time to collect sunlight for the purpose of all the work that it does inside your body. Right. Yeah. So this is a this is a completely different thing than the other things. The other two things are there for making sure that your your biological clock is in rhythm with all the other biological clocks. And l- let me kind of unpack that idea for just a second, because th- that can be confusing to some people. Like, what is, what is, do I what do I mean? And th- the thing you had to understand is that your body is not one thing. Right. It's actually a whole bunch of organ systems that are talking to themselves all the time, right? So just like me and you have different time zones right now, we coordinated so that our clocks would line up and we both knew what was happening, right? That's no different. So think about it uh, like that concept of time zones with planets, right? So there's Mars and there's Earth. Their days are completely different length of time, but, but if you coordinate them, they can match up. Right. And you can land in certain places. Right. That's what they're planning to send people to Mars and all that type of stuff with like just coordinating the right time, the right month to take off the land exactly where you need to land because you're coordinating events. Your body is doing that. My eyes are trying to coordinate with my liver. My liver is trying to coordinate with my uh, pancreas, my pancreas with my lungs. They all have to coordinate the different. The problem is at the cellular level. They might as well be in another galaxy or on the other side of the solar system. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. the their scales are really different. Their time zones are really different, right? So making sure that you see daylight in the morning and keep it as dark as possible at night is the thing that continues to keep all the time zones lined up. Working properly. Yes. So that's what those two things are doing. The morning daylight and getting it as dark as early as possible and avoiding bright light at night. Those two things keep the rhythm going. Now, the other thing that I go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I know. I was going to say that if you if you manage to to just implement those things, you will see massive changes in, in the way you feel in your health and your hormones and, and everything. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, now what I was going to mention before, uh, the, the next part is not like that. It doesn't have a lot to do with your circadian rhythm. It has to do with collecting sunlight for the purpose of doing work inside your body, like making your sex hormones, right. And making your vitamin D and rate and, and tuning your immune system correctly. Right. And this is the other bonus where I would say, uh, if you can take your lunch, right. Like you just, you work a normal nine to five, but you, you get a lunch break, right? I would say the ideal scenario is that you take it outside, right? Whether that's sitting at a bench or, you know, getting to a, a nearby park, or maybe you're literally just out in the parking lot, right? Like I've done that, uh, where I just go out in the parking lot and I literally uh, just stand next to the, my car and take my shirt off, right? And literally just soak in as much time as you can in the middle part of the day. The reason why I say that is the middle part of the day is where UVA and UVB light exist. They don't exist at those other times of the uh, day. So that's another thing that I would say uh, that's beneficial about the strategy, strategy that I just mentioned before, where it's morning sunlight. Morning sunlight has no UV light in it. So it can't hurt your skin at all. You could, if you had, uh, uh, if you could be like, uh, let's just say hypothetically, the sun comes up at 6 p, uh, six a.m. and you don't have to be to work until 9 a.m., right? If you could spend all three hours of that daylight outside, you're not going to get burned and you're only going to get benefits, right? So for people with really sensitive skin, you want to try to get as much of the first three hours of the day and the last three hours of the day as possible. That starts training the skin for sunlight exposure, just like we talked about the bicep uh, curl analogy. That's what the starting sets should be as those evening time frames. And then as you progress and your skin gets more adaptable, you can start squeezing that down and getting more of the middle time of the day and you will progress that. So that's why I say start with the, those two endpoints of the day and then move to the middle part of the day of taking a lunch break where you want to on purposely get more skin involved. You want to treat it like a tanning session, uh, you know, like an old school tanning session, not not the kind where you go in, in, a, in, a, in a place and pay $20 to get fried but an old school tanning session where you're at outside getting just you're just there enjoying the sun 10 15 minutes 
turn around, get your back, 10, 15 minutes, go back inside. I promise you, if that's your lunch break, you're going to feel way more energized for the second half of the day because UV light is now donating electrons to you directly and causing other processes to turn on and then uh, basically amplifying your mood at the same time too because uh, what one of the major proteins uh, that sunlight interacts with is called POMC, P-O-M-C. You don't really need to know a whole lot more about it other than this. It splits up into specific amino acids that dictate other things like the release of stress hormones like catecholamines that regulate insulin and hunger and things of that nature, but also another uh, protein called lipopro uh, lipoprotein that um, has to do with lipid metabolism. And then uh, the next one after that is um, uh, beta endorphin. So that palm C, when it gets interacted by sunlight, you make a small amount of beta endorphin and that acts on your opioid, opioid receptors. So what it does, it actually diminishes pain and raises pleasure. So just that little 30 minute sunlight exposure, not only will have you not having a headache, you know, because you've been inside in under bright lights all morning, uh, but it'll also make it so that you raise the ability to just kind of be more more joyous in the way because you're you're kind of high, you're kind of high on your opioid receptor, right? This that's how o opioids work. That's also why opioids are so addictive, right? Because they hammer that receptor incredibly hard compared to sunlight. But sunlight is the reason why we have those receptors. We're designed to be a nocturnal creature or di diurnal creatures. So our, our op opioid receptor is tied to the protein that interacts with sunlight. Okay. If we were a nocturnal creature, it's flipped it's around. Correct. That, that's incredible, man. So basically sunlight is, is one of the keys to just good health and having a high- Absolutely. Health. Yeah, absolutely. Any Anybody who's telling you any different, you should highly like, and that's the thing is, uh, it might not be as relevant in, in Mexico, but I know in the US, it's a big thing, right? Like every single doctor tells yeah. you to stay out of the sun. It's like, that's why I wanted to ask you, like people are going to be worried about skin cancer and wrinkles. So yeah. So another big benefit. Uh, okay, so let's put it this way. Uh, let's just talk about what uh, so wrinkles are one that you can avoid by actual using sunlight. So versus versus uh, the glass, the other important thing about sun behind the glass, I would avoid sun behind glass because what it does is it gets intensified and the good amount of sunlight that actually would keep your skin hydrated, it gets cut out. Remember how I said uh, UV light gets cut by 80% and infrared light gets cut by about 40 to 60%. The infrared light, keeps you from getting wrinkles okay okay and, and they actually advertise that right like the photobiomodulation panels that you can get and shine on yourself that, that's what they're, they're they're like oh it'll raise your atp it'll give you energy it'll reduce wrinkles they're not joking it will do that so things that will accelerate that is anything that is hard sunlight that doesn't have any red so sunlight behind glass will cause more wrinkles than not and some studies actually have proven that and they, but the, the thing is they word it wrongly. They word it saying sunlight caused this. The problem is I just told you that it wasn't sunlight. There's no way it can be because the glass changes the light, right? So when I say sunlight, I literally mean there is nothing between you and the big ball in the sky. That's when I say, sun, if, are you getting sunlight? That's what I mean. So that's number one. If you are, if you get sunlight, you don't have to worry about wrinkles because it brings a lot of infrared with it. And that's what keeps skin hydrated and things of that nature. And the infrared is higher in the beginning at the end of the day. Yeah. It's only infrared at the beginning and the end of the day. Right. So that's why, that's why it's, that's why I said, fundamentally, you want to have a job that allows you that, that first three hours of the day to dedicate to yourself, to just getting a good amount of, of red sun. Right. Now, are there hacks for people like, if you work shifts, shift works. Yeah, that's, wh that's where those panels come in handy for people like that, that literally cannot be outside for free uh, for three hours in the first day of the uh, first part of the day, right? If, from the sun up, you have about three hours to get a lot of infrared light and, and tune the, the circadian rhythm.
Um, and that will be wrinkle-free sunlight that you're getting, okay? <laughs> and then, um, uh, sorry, kind of a rewind on what was the second part of that? So there was wrinkles wrinkle and then, wrinkles. oh, cancer, cancer. Oh, yes. Um, okay, so this is interesting. Okay, so um, cancer is defined by a cell that, doesn't care about information anymore, just about energy, because it just replicates, right? It just keeps replicating and that turns into a tumor and it just gets bigger and bigger, but they're still cells, right? They're still using energy. It's not like they're, you know, necrotic or, you know, they're not dying. Um, the, the thing is they don't know what they should be, right? They don't know if they should be an ear or skin or a liver cell. They, they don't care about the information. They don't care about being told what they do. They just care about making more of themselves. So right away, you can see that it's a cellular problem of information versus just energy production. When you lack UV light, you actually lack the ability to tell the body how to eliminate cells that don't know the information. So me and you right now, we have cancer, right? Like we have cancerous cells but every night we go to sleep and ideally our body takes care of them every night okay right that that's that's how it, like that, that's actually not too foreign most people kind of know that doctors have kind of fundamentally agreed that yeah pretty much our body is clearing cancerous cells cells that don't actually function very well anymore basically every evening you're meant to do that that's called uh autophagy or apoptosis yeah. right yeah. So faulty cells that no longer care about information, they get cleared out every evening. If they don't get cleared out, more of them and more of them collate. And that's now going to eventually come into what could be called cancer because now it's detectable, right? It's actually become a large enough mass of all these cells that don't know information anymore, right? So that that is fundamentally cancer. Some cancers are actually genetic where it's like you're you just inherited that cancer, right? Yeah. Uh, from from the nuclear gene, genome, right? So that means there's actual defective DNA in you, right? Now, that's very small amount of cancers. That's like 5%. The other 95% are cancers that have an energy problem. In other words, the mitochondria in those cell membranes no longer make energy very well so the cell starts to replicate more and more and more that's it that's kind of like a, a rough analogy to just kind of get you to, to make the next leap that i'm trying to make you to get you to make which is the mitochondria have red light and blue light detectors in them remember how i said the the red light panels help you make atp yeah. they do that by letting the mitochondria create more ATP for free because red light can power the ATPase. So think of it like uh, when you put a, a, a water wheel in, in a river, right? It, it creates energy just by the water flowing. Yeah. Well, light flows, right? Like it flows like water does, but it does it in, in special ways because it's a particle and a wave. So when it hits the mitochondria, it flows through those tissues appropriately because they're surrounded by water and water is a red light chromophore and that spins that ATP ace. So you make more ATP from less food. Okay. So remember what I said about the people that, that they, they're out in strong sunlight and they, they can go longer without any, this is one of the reasons why their ATP ace is spinning and making more ATP without them for the same amount of food as other people. So when, when, uh, when your mitochondria detect that, uh, that that's no longer happening, it demands more food. And then it starts sending cellular signals of um, to tell the cell to market for uh, ubiquination. So it's called met, uh, methylation. So basically, uh, it marks the cell so that later when you go to sleep, uh, you're going to get rid of that cell. Okay. Right? But when you don't have any UVA light, you can't mark the cell. Okay. So when you go to sleep, you won't clear as many as you should have. So and sunlight then that can help pretty much prevent 
cancer to develop with within you, I guess. Is that what yeah? It, what it does is it, it excel. It, it makes sure because again, this isn't fun. Getting rid of cancer is a fundamental biological process that we have within us. The problem is one of the things that allows it to understand what cells are cancers and which ones are not is tied to the sunlight. And the reason uh, is, uh, and, and you probably know this, right? Like uh, a, a, v, a vegan diet has a lot of antioxidants because you're eating a lot of variety of, of plant uh, polyphenols and all these types of things. So you have a lot of antioxidants and generally that's that's a good thing. The reason for that is because the more sunlight you get, the more and the more food that you eat and all of that, uh, the more ROS, reactive oxygen species you make, which is uh, what the antioxidants are fixing, right? Um, or supposed to fix. The, the main antioxidant that does that is melatonin. But uh, when, uh, when that happens, uh, the reactive oxygen species are actually the signal that I was talking about right? The mitochondria sends out a signal to the cell to mark the cell for, for uh, ubiquination, which is getting rid of the cell with autophagy or apoptosis. That signal is that ROS. So when you eat a lot of food, you're going to make ROS, right? So, the, and that's actually not really a foreign concept either. The bigger the animal is for the species, the shorter the lifespan. That's a pretty well-known fact. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is because of that turnover. The bigger you are, the more food you're going to consume, et cetera. And you're going to make more reactive oxygen species. So you're going to mark cells faster for turnover. Now, sunlight also makes some of that. Most people would think, oh, well, that's a bad thing. And that's actually not a bad thing because sunlight is the stress test for the mitochondria. If the mitochondria is running really, really well, it's going to continue to make the same amount of ROS when the sunlight hits it because see there are some parts of the of the red light spectrum or the spectrum of the sun that create more energy rather than less. So when it hits it it stresses the mitochondria and if the mitochondria continues to make the right amount of ROS then that cell is the same as another cell that's also healthy. But compare that to a sick cell where the sunlight hit it and the mitochondria was somewhat faulty, the ATPase didn't spin very well anymore. So it created more ROS than the rest of the cells around it. That's part of the process of marking it okay. for, for getting rid of. Okay. So middle of the day sunlight, because of the UVA in it, is the stress test for, those. for the mitochondria to send the signal to go, hey, this cell is slightly underperforming. And if there are enough marks on that cell, then that cell will get autophagy or apoptosis. Like, and again, there's a lot of science that we could have gone through to get like all the details of that. But I'm trying to make it so that it's understandable and a good analogy. But I'm gonna have to watch. It, I'm gonna watch it a couple more times just to grasp it better. But 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 yeah. So basically, the sunlight will determine will help determine which mitochondria are working properly, and if they're not. It'll mark it somehow, and then in the night, we'll just get rid of that faulty cell. And if you don't get infrared, or not infrared, UVA light, then you are slowing down the process of your body figuring out which ones are the good ones that we keep, and which ones are the ones that are faulty, and which ones are the ones that are like, oh, those are way gone. We just got to get rid of them, right? Think of it like, like you're uh, an owner of a, a large fleet of cars, right? Like a rental company, right? If you have a rental company and it it a car breaks down, that's going to cost you a lot of money, right? So if you just stay ahead of the game and you just make sure that every car is running really good, and the moment the car is kind of underperforming, you just kind of put that off to the side, right? And and not use it as much as far as your rentals. And then once it's like underperforming by quite a bit, you just get rid of it, right? Because you don't want it to break down with a customer in it, right? That is essentially what's going on. So the easiest way to tell if which cars are going to be underperforming is you get in them, right? Every night. And you hook them up to a dynameter, right? And you stress test the engine. You literally hammer on it and they test, you know, they see everything just like a car, right? And you would be like, oh, this one's performing great. Good, good, good. And then this one you hammer and it's like, oh, this one's underperforming now. That's exactly what's going on there because it's an energy test for the engine of your, of your, of your body, right? Like everybody, uh, hopefully if you don't now, the most important part of every cell is your mitochondria. It is the powerhouse of the cell, right? Like when you were learned it in school and whatnot. So 
That is literally what it's doing. It's powering everything. So your body learns to stress test it while you're alive, which makes sense, right? Like if you're always repairing yourself and everything, it's it's good to know which ones you don't have to get rid of, right? Why spend unnecessary energy? But the flip side to that is if you ruin that, if you ruin that signaling, you've also ruined the ability to get rid of the bad things. So sunlight, sunlight is is key to life. Um, this is a very interesting topic, and there's so much more that you can unpack here, and so much more stuff yeah. you can dive into. So if someone wants to to find you, David, and and just know learn more about this, learn more about how interacting with with Earth is going to help them with their life, with their health, with their fitness. Like, what's the best way to find you, consume your content? possibly reach out to you for a consultation. What's the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, the, the, I'm most active on Instagram. Uh, so the, the solar athlete is, uh, the Instagram for, uh, to, to be able to like really talk about all the sunlight stuff, all the cold stuff. That's also where you can, uh, uh, go to the website link in there in the bio. And all of that is in there as far as like the modules that I offer, consultations, et cetera. My second Instagram is David Herrera 1119. And that's where I'm going to have other podcasts like this and like training videos and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and I bought one of, your mo of the modules, the one about sunlight, and it's been very, very interesting, very practical recommendations. So I highly suggest that if you go to his Instagram, you you invest in those modules because they're going to not only give you the reasoning of, of why you why it's important to do these things, but also give you practical recommendations that you can implement in your day-to-day -day that are going to help you with whatever you deal with. And if you yeah, have yeah. more details, uh, you can always reach out to David for a, a consultation. Yeah, and I, I will say one more thing. The, the, the way that the Instagram is set up is not practical it's it's the science right it's the science of everything it's just there to catch people's eyes and if you understand it then you really start to understand it right like if if you understand the diagrams are they're they're biological in nature they're the science the modules that like that uh that um you said they are literally just like you said they are there to tell you this is why it's important and as lame in terms as i can get it and then give you concise actionable stuff that you can literally start doing that day yeah, and for me, it was exactly like you described. I was I was looking at the Instagram and some of the things. So I was like, well, I just don't really understand what's going on here. You kind of can grasp little bits and pieces of of the post if you don't have you know a background in, in biology or science. But then once I went through the module, I was like, oh, this is now I get it. This is a lot easier to understand and practical recommendations that were that I implemented that same day. Yeah, 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 and and uh, I also launched uh, the ability to you can essentially get a semi consultation because I've launched a membership option too, where you get, uh, you will eventually get all of the modules uh, over the course of two months. And you also get a live Q and A with me, uh, a zoom Q and A uh, every second Sunday of the, of the month in America, the government, the, the people in government, and I'm not talking about all of them. Like I'm not saying every single politician is making money off of what I'm about to say, but let's just say this way. It's suspicious that they all get richer, but somehow our country is going more in debt. Like just none of that shit makes sense, right? Like if if I'm working for an employer and I start seeing this process going on, I start going, huh, there's something going on because I fundamentally don't understand where you're getting all this money. I'm telling you, this is where they, the people, that are benefiting from this, and it's blatantly obvious, have financial ties to big pharma, okay? So anything that they can do to make you sicker a little bit earlier for a little bit longer or more intense, so the treatment is more expensive, they make more money. Yeah, literally. Financial, yeah, they, they get financial rewards for that for you. Being yeah. And th now they don't want to kill you. Don't get me wrong. They don't want to kill you. They just want to make sure that you're not well the whole time you're alive. <laughs> right. Like that, that, like that, that's fundamentally what I'm saying. Right. Like, cause think of it, let, let's just hypothetically put it all out there and put it in a concise time window. Right. And it's perfect. The sun's even shining with me. Um, <laughs> I gotta go outside. <laughs> so, <laughs> so 
um, <clears throat> it goes like this. You graduate, right? You're 18 years old. You are now taxable, okay? <laughs> so how can we get you sooner to maybe stop sleeping very well so that you need sleep medications or maybe start uh, needing something like uh, – depression medications or something you, you like anything right or or even uh, uh just a, a simple metformin like a diabetic pre-diabetic right like where where can we get you taking one of these because these aren't going to kill you right now or in 15 years or any of those things but where can we get you so now we got a prescription on you for that they get you by turning Recur you in, recurring to get one, yeah to, to get into one of those and and what we just said earlier was the lack of sunlight will cause most of those things. So anything that I can tell you to convince you to somehow get less sunlight will eventually pay off, especially if I'm telling the whole uh, country to do so, right? Like that's 300 million people, yeah, right? Oh. So if I, if I get 100 million people, which is a third, I'm doing pretty damn good, right? So I just start telling people that, hey, sunlight's bad for you. You need to really cover up, blah, 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 blah. Eventually, you just say it long enough that somebody starts repeating it, right? And that's all it really takes. And then next thing you know, everybody's repeating it, right? Like, we are, we all saw this. Yeah. It happened during COVID, right? Like, all just about every single conspiracy theorist about COVID turned out to be true. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you got to start thinking in that realm of, of okay, so... They're literally trying to keep you from the sunlight because you will get sicker sooner and they have drugs for that. That's why when I, you know, said that some of the things about sunlight, about how it influences your dopamine receptor, how it influences uh, your dopamine receptor and, and your noradrenaline and adrenaline and your thyroid receptors. We didn't get too much into those, but it influences all of those things, right? What, what are the things that most people are going to call, uh, you know, tell you like our age, right? Mid thirties uh, or upper thirties in their forties. What kind of medications are there? They're on thyroid medications. They're on uh, insulin medications. They're on depression, depressive medications. Wow. Right? Like, those are like the big three right there, right? Yeah. And those... Cholesterol uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they'll... The, but the cholesterol is kind of a funny one. They're, they're treating a, a thing that's not a thing, right? Like, because of what I said at the very beginning of that, that podcast was uh, that uh, cholesterol is made to be turned into things yeah but so when you see high cholesterol the whole process up yeah yeah you're just you're yeah there's no sunlight and you're blocking the whole process up right so they're treating a pro like they're they're looking at the problem and instead of thinking about why would cholesterol go up and then fundamentally start checking everything that comes from cholesterol like that's what I would do. Like if I was working at at a at a plant, right, and all of a sudden I see this thing backing up or go, getting more of, I go, well, what's downstream of that, so that I can fix that and get that. Yeah. It doesn't take a like this is not crazy hard thinking, right? <laughs> so for that, right? <laughs> right, like uh, yeah, that that's what I'm saying. Like you know, there's all these studies on cholesterol and apoB and little a and all these uh you know big molecules of cholesterol, small molecules, high density. I'm like, you guys are way overthinking this. Like I've been reading blood work for about six years, and I just immediately go to cholesterol, go to testosterone, go to DHEA, and go to to estrogen. And if those are tanked and cholesterol is through the roof. You're like, well, that's the problem. That's backed up somewhere in the creation of your sex hormones. It's really that simple. Most, right? most often it's just, just lack of sunlight. Yeah. Right? So, so think of it this way. You're an 18-year-old guy. You're full of you're full of sex hormones. So that whole system is revved up, right? Like you're creating the most sex, sex hormones that you're going to create. And then all of a sudden you get thrown in in a, you know, working a shift work job or a nine to five or 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 a night job, you know, because that's all you can get. And next thing you know, you've been doing it for six years, right? Wow. Right. So now you're now you're 24 years old, 
right? You're 24 years old and you have high cholesterol and your sex hormones are a little bit on the low performing side, maybe possibly tanked. Your vitamin D for sure is low and your immune system is compromised because your vitamin D is low. So now think about all the different things that I can sell you if I'm big pharma. And the thing is, you don't even, most people think that they don't even have a choice, right? Like big pharma just tells you to take them. Yeah. Right. You go to the doctor and he sees all these things. Oh, you have all these things. And then, and then, uh, you know, he goes, well, you can eat better and diet and exercise. Uh, and again, I'm not saying this happens on the very first time you go in there, right. And you have all these symptoms. I'm just saying by the time you've be, you know, graduated and now you're 24 years old. Yeah. It's been, it's been seven, eight years. Yeah, of, of this this cycle. And and then you go into the doctor for the first time because you just got an actual job that has insurance, right? So you're 24, 25 years old usually when that happens, right? Yeah. And so now you're a 25, 24 year old, you're a grown up and you you just you just got a, a, a better paying job that actually pays for insurance and stuff. And you go to the doctor for the first time and they tell you all this stuff and you go, oh, well, shit, I guess I should work out or, you know, and, and, you know, and I'm not saying those don't help, right? For at that age, a lot of those are going to help. Just working out is going to lower your cholesterol because you're a more resilient human being at that point. And if you're a young guy, you're also going to be outside a lot more at that time too, right? And you're going to be working out. You're going to be doing things at that point in time because you'll go into the doctor and he'll tell you all these things. The doctor won't prescribe you anything right there he'll just tell you all these things oh yeah there's the cholesterol thing you could take a drug you just clean up your diet right your sex hormones ah, it's probably because you're just not working out right like the most a good doctor is going to tell you these things or should be telling you these things right if not i'm telling you those these things that's how the first doctor yeah, consultation probably. should go right if if you're a 24 year old guy and it's the first time you've get, gone in to do a full blood work and everything because your insurance is finally going to pay for it and, and you go in there and you get told all these things, you start working out and you start eating good. And, and mo uh, some of the things will get better on the blood work, right? And then you continue on this path and you just go, oh, it's another decade, right? Another decade later and the same problems creep back in. Yeah. Uh, even though you've, you know, cause it's only been like, you know, by the time you're 28, that's 10 years, right? You've been out of, out of uh, school for 10 years but you've been living this lifestyle that's lack of sunlight. And so now the same things keep happening because you're lacking the same thing. That's fundamentally should alert you to, well, I keep doing all the things I should be doing, but somehow a lot of these things continue to get out of whack. Fundamentally, I must not be doing what's actually controlling them. Yeah. Right. Now, again, that's me thinking for myself and how I came across this, this logic of thinking, right? But what starts to happen about that time, right? Remember how I said there's the decades. At about a decade long is when you start to experience the depressive type stuff. Yeah. And the sleep deprivation type stuff, right? So the, by the time that you're, you know, 30 years old, you're like, yeah, I don't really sleep as good as I used to anymore or anything like that. You can't think as clear anymore. And so then you just kind of go with whatever the doctor says. Right. Because because see, fundamentally, you know, go back to you were you were 24. You got told all these things. You did more, uh, you know, healthier food choices, working out and everything kind of fixes itself. And then by the time you're 30, 32, uh, you you still are kind of starting to have these problems crop back up. But your thinking is impaired now because you're not sleeping well. And 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 you're and you're basically mentally slightly in in brain fog yeah right and now you and possibly slightly depressed right so now so now you get depressed about that situation and you kind of outsource your health for a moment and the doctor that's like the second or third time that you probably dealt with the doctor or or more right if you got a yearly checkups and then finally they go well you know what we should probably just take some some crestor for your you know, your, your cholesterol or a statin or something like that, 
or, you know, here's a prescription for your sex hormones for some testosterone replacement therapy, you know, and at 32, you're probably not going to run into those because those are downstream. Remember, it's going to be first is going to be something for your cholesterol or something for your depression or something for your sleep, right? Or something for your get out of work first and then downstream. Yeah. Every yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then by the time you're getting closer to your 40, now it's starting to show up in your sex hormones and you have guys that are literally 